what is it that triggers the final decision? That split-second moment that steals a life and plunges the killer into a void of guilt. I knew by the expression on his face that something was wrong. Seriously wrong. After a killing so brutal, the killer first cannot bear to leave the victim, then cannot bear to stay. But there's no fleeing the horror of the act. Any crime like this will rock a community and it will devastate a family who have lost someone under such tragic and such violent circumstances. What follows is a cat and mouse game, a killer who must be found. We had to establish who was responsible, uh, where they were, was it murder, was it man's daughter? Sift through a lot of information to actually get to the truth. This was a crime that turned on jealousy, betrayal, the most brutal of endings to what should have been a shared dream. Snettisham in Norfolk, a community of a thousand households on the edge of the fens, a magnet for visitors drawn to its pubs and its charm and the vast beaches of the Wash. It appears in the Doomsday Book of 1086, but something precious lay hidden here for a thousand years before that. The Snettisham Horde, pre-Christian symbols of power and love, perhaps. Other things lay hidden here, and they too were to do with power and love. But when they came to the surface, they brought only tragedy. The central characters in our story didn't start life here. This is where they came with their dream. Twenty miles away, and in the 80s, Becky Thorpe was growing up with her parents in the tiny village of Sholdenthorpe. She was a pupil at Downham Market High School. School initially was not easy for her. She was a pupil that would much rather be unnoticed and, and quietly just uh, go about her business. That didn't apply on the sports field. Taylor here! Oh, Taylor! Although she was only uh, an average run-of-the-mill student, Quick, here. Um, her sport carried her. She would fight cat and dog to uh, win the ball and uh, nobody was got standing away when she got going. She dreamed of a career in sport, but while still at school, started doing work experience at Timbers Motel in Fincham, near her home. This she took on board like she takes everything else that she wants to do, took it by the scruff of the neck and um, got stuck into it. When she left school, she went to the College of West Anglia in Kings Lynn and qualified as a chef. She returned to the motel in 2003. Okay, you really need to keep on stirring this. I need that prep. And eventually became head chef. Add a bit of seasoning to this and we should be done. She had similar success when she moved to a pub, but then things went wrong. Um, what do you think a dispute going? arose with new managers and she claimed unfair dismissal. At a tribunal, she was granted a financial settlement. But for now, the dream of running kitchens had soured. Becky was 24. She began a relationship with an older man and decided to switch careers. She got a job as a dental technician and within a year was a fully qualified dental nurse. But once again, she hit problems as her relationship collapsed. I think the gentleman would like to have taken the relationship further, probably thinking about children. Rebecca didn't, at the time, want to go down that route. It was now 2008. Becky found herself single, unhappy, and in need of extra cash to supplement her modest wages. She took bar shifts at a local hotel. She turned back to the uh, trade that she, she knew and loved 
um, and moved and went back into the uh, puppet industry. In December 2008, she switched to a pub nearby, the Dray and Horses at Totten Hill. And suddenly, things moved fast. The pub was run by Michael Tucker in his late 40s and his partner, with whom he had two children. There was a mutual attraction between Becky and Michael. Michael, are you going to change that barrel? Yeah, I'm just a bit busy at the moment, yeah. You could change it now? In a few minutes. And quite soon after that, a relationship uh, developed between them. Within days, Michael was giving Becky a bracelet for Christmas. I love it. Do you? Do you I really? Do. I do. He invited her to join him and his family for Christmas dinner. One week later, meltdown. <laughs> On New Year's Eve, uh, 2008 leading into 2009, Michael's partner found text messages on Michael's phone from Becky. Michael! Mm -hmm. Michael, would you like to explain these? <laughs> hey, yeah. What's what? What are you talking about? I'm talking about... There was a row about... during which plates were smashed. <laughs> Michael's partner asked Becky to leave the pub. New Year's Eve, for Christ's sake! Do you think people want to celebrate like this? I am calling the police! Go on. I'm leaving! The police were called by Michael's partner. Apologies, everyone. So that she could be removed from that property with the children to a place of safety. Becky fled from the pub to the flat she rented in Downham Market. Uh, Michael tried to get her attention, but uh, she didn't answer the door that night. Bex. And it was uh, a day or two later that uh, they finally got together and then the relationship resumed from there. Michael's partner took their children back to Ireland, where she came from, leaving Becky, now 27, with a man more than 20 years older than her, whom she barely knew. We don't know a huge amount about Michael other than he was born and raised in, in the Kent area. Um, he had a number of brothers and sisters, but never seemed to be particularly close with them. Michael, who was brought up in the town of Swanley, had a troubled childhood. His father died when he was young. Michael left home at a reasonably young age to go out and, and find his way in the world and, and moved from one pub to another. He would flip from job to job. Now he was at the Dray and Horses, where Becky decided to throw in her lot with him. Hey, that was great, wasn't it? How busy were we? Yeah, it was good. She ditched her job as a dental nurse and moved in. She had a new man and she was about to make her dream career a reality. Or so she thought. Mother's Day 2009. At the Dray and Horses pub at Totten Hill in Norfolk, Becky Thorpe, age 27, and her new partner, Michael Tucker, are preparing for some special guests. You're all right. Yeah, I'm fine. Michael, can we just uh, take the flowers, please, and put them on the table? Make sure they're going to go when my mum's sitting. Becky's parents knew nothing of the showdown when Michael's former partner discovered he and Becky were having an affair. She walked out, taking their two children to Ireland. Perfect timing, everything's ready, come in. We went along and, and that was when we first met Michael. Uh, this is Mike. Lovely to meet you. Come on through. Michael seemed uh, a very pleasant gentleman. Uh, he could hold conversation with uh, basically anybody on almost any subject. It wasn't until later that we did begin to realise that things were a bit more than uh, just a business relationship. Then, in the village of Snettisham, a few miles away, the tenancy of another pub, the Compasses Inn, came free. It had been empty for 12 months. At the time of filming for this programme, it was undergoing restoration. So much space mm -hmm. in the kitchen. <laughs> it's tempting. It's seriously tempting, yeah. 
I think the compasses to Becky was a fresh start. She wanted something that was her own, um, rather than stay at the Dray and Horses where Michael was with his previous partner and the children. They took the tenancy, spent several weeks restoring the pub, and held a grand opening at Easter 2009. I think most of the local people were pleased to see that the, uh, the, the pub was uh, coming back to life again. But almost immediately, it became clear something was amiss. Michael, I could do with your help if you want land. I'm busy, it's fine. We were getting vibes that uh, things were not always as uh, cosy as we was led to believe. Michael? I won't be a sec. Becky had spoke about that Michael was drinking probably a little bit more than one should. Michael was an alcoholic. The, the bottles of, of, of alcohol were, were secreted at different locations, in his vehicle, um, in the garden area, and indeed around the pub. He uh, would drink about 10 pints a day, um, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. A week after the opening, Becky received a phone call. Hi. You're where? What do you mean you've done something stupid? She got into the car and drove over from uh, Snettersham to the Dray and Horses. My God. <sighs> he was taken into the Queen Elizabeth Hospital at King's Lynn with a suspected overdose. She never got to the bottom of why he did that. Michael returned to the pub where business was tough. The compasses faced competition. The passing trade was not uh, great, and uh, the village also supports two other public houses. So it was a little bit of an uphill struggle. Becky was the one that did the, the bookkeeping, she would run the kitchen, and she would also work in the bar. Michael was, was drinking regularly and visiting other licensed premises other than the one he was meant to be running. That in itself was causing financial problems. Yes, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'm on my way. Yeah, I'll be there. It got to a point where um, there were bills that couldn't be paid. Um, there were suppliers that refused to supply um, alcohol to the pub unless they were paid cash in advance. Becky held back from investing all the money she'd received at Industrial Tribunal. There was a, some friction that Michael was probably aware that uh, Becky had probably still got um, a little bit more money um, put by. And um, he would like to have uh, made use of it. He's, he's but like, outwardly, he? Becky and Michael's okay. relationship so, appeared to be weathering the challenges. He's got a story, you know. Yeah. He's entertained. Hello. Oh, guys. Bex, how are you doing? Yeah, good, busy. Hey, all mine. Yeah. All mine. And she's beautiful. He was very open in, in his uh, affection for her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bex, kiss, 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 kiss. Mm. He would hug her and kiss her in front of customers, sometimes to the point where it became uncomfortable for those customers. Here's your backs. Michael's devotedness intensified, became controlling. No more for yourself. Michael was um, very possessive with Becky. Don't get your hopes up, mate. This one is mine, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. If he saw her, even just talking with a male customer, he would kiss her in front of that customer in a way of saying, look, this is my property, keep your hands off. He didn't want her going out with her friends. He would um, get her to stay at the pub and work at the pub. But for Becky, that was a non-starter. Hey, where are you going? Hockey. You're joking, I need you here. Bye. She didn't uh, appreciate being dominated uh, in any way. I think if Rebecca was being um, controlled or tried to be controlled by Michael, uh, and she would very firmly put Michael in his place. Early that summer of 2009, Michael once again 
did something which startled and upset Becky. I'm just going to get some bread and milk, yeah? OK. Michael told Becky that he was going to the local shop. But he, in fact, disappeared for some three weeks without any notice to Becky, without telling her where he was going. Becky tried repeatedly to contact him, but without success. In the end, she reported him missing. And then after three weeks, he attended a police station in London. And then she drove down to London and picked him up. Where the hell have you been? He initially told her that he had gone to rehab during that time, um, but the details that he had given her, we researched and found no such uh, premises existed. It's thought Michael actually went to Ireland, where his former partner and two children were living. You get mine, will you? I'll have a glass of wine. See you in a sec. In August 2009, it was Michael's turn for a shock. A local woman went to the compasses with her partner of that time and confronted Michael. Can I have a quick word? Yeah, what's up? OK. It's about Becky and my partner. I found texts from her on his phone. A lot of them. The woman had come to the pub with her partner when it first opened. It's alleged that after that time, her partner had frequently returned alone. There's no independent evidence that what the woman feared was actually true. Well, look at them. Listen. I think they're having an affair. If I thought they were having an affair, I've got a gun upstairs. I'd blow their heads off. You'd find him at the bottom of Hunstanton Cliffs. That same month, August 2009, something happened that was to stretch the relationship between Becky and Michael to breaking point. Becky had gone up to bed after um, a, a shift in the pub. Michael was due to follow her upstairs. chair away and then was momentarily hanging by the neck with a rope. The rope gave way. Oh, Mike! Oh, what have you done? Becky later reported it had been nailed to a beam but wouldn't have supported a loaf of bread. <sighs> I can't cope with this anymore, Mike. Whether he was waiting for her to come in order to do that so that it looked as if he was trying to commit suicide or whether he was actually doing that, not knowing she was coming down the corridor, I'm inclined to go with the former. Once again, Michael was taken to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn. Michael actually claimed that he and Becky had been having sexual intercourse and that it was um, an experiment that had gone wrong and in fact it was some sort of sexual gratification, the fact that uh, he was hanging and um, had a rope around his neck at that time, which is something that Becky denied. From hospital, he deluged Becky with texts and calls, asking her not to end the relationship. In the end, she relented. She had an investment both emotionally and financially within the compasses and still had that dream of making it a, a complete success. She decided to go back and, and uh, try and make a go of it. Things seemed then to become calmer. Though there's some evidence uncovered only after tragic and momentous events about to unfold, that Michael and Becky were sleeping separately. Some rooms were developed for bed and breakfast customers, some were for staff only. Becky's makeup and personal belongings were found in a rental room. But just before Valentine's Day in February 2010, when she went to visit her parents, she seemed happy. Hiya, Daddy, all right? Get the kettle on? She'd got some ideas for the summer. She'd got one or two plans for fundraising events with barbecues and, 
and the such like in the uh, in the beer garden. And... Yeah, happy at the moment. It's all going okay. You and Mum. The exact date of what happened next isn't clear. Some reports say March the 9th, 2010. On March the 10th, Becky was said to have signed a receipt for a customer, but with no warning, she disappeared. Michael was left running the pub on his own. And how's the lovely lady? Uh, she's, uh, she's not well at all. She'll be all right a few days, I reckon. On March the 13th, 2010, Michael employed two new barmen. On Saturday, March the 20th, they arrived to open up. What's going on? Michael just texted me. We're closed until Monday. He was going to spend some time with Becky, but he would return on Monday morning. But Michael wasn't at the pub on Monday morning. Instead, after the barman opened up, and without giving an explanation, Michael sent a text asking them to get the local police to call him. And the officer tried uh, dialing Michael's number but got no reply. So that particular incident was logged um, to follow up at a, at a later time. The following day, Tuesday, March the 23rd, 2010, a woman arrived at the pub in a state of anxiety. Later events would show she had a relationship with Michael which went beyond that between customer and publican. I've just received this. She too had received text messages, but the contents of hers were devastating. The barman flagged down a passing off duty policeman. Behind the pub, Becky's true fate was revealed. She was dead, and Michael had disappeared. It's six o'clock on Wednesday, the 24th of March, 2010. A body has been found at Snettisham, West Norfolk. Police have sealed off a section of the village. Because I was still in a half uh, sleep, I didn't sort of register too much and thought, oh dear, how tragic, and left it at that. The body is believed to be that of a young woman. Something just struck a chord with me that something wasn't all well. And I'd got the uh, telephone number of the detective constable that's uh, actually a family friend. He said, well, stay exactly where you are and I will be with you in 10 minutes. The previous day, Peter's 29-year-old daughter, Becky, landlady of the Compasses Inn at Snettisham in Norfolk, had been found dead in an outbuilding. Wrapped in a duvet and plastic sheeting, bound with duct tape, her body lay deep frozen in a chest freezer. When something catastrophic has happened, your body and your brain seems to know what needs to be done. but your emotions just go completely out the window. A lot had already happened in what had become a rapidly unfolding investigation. There are a lot of things to manage immediately. There's the concern of uh, the forensic examination of the scene. Normally we would look to um, instigate a, a forensic post-mortem. However, because Becky was frozen, we had to wait several days for her body to thaw before we could carry that process out. A priority was to find Michael Tucker, Becky's 50-year-old business partner and lover. He'd vanished, but not without trace. Police already knew that since the Saturday he disappeared, he'd been sending texts, not just to his barman, but to the woman who had led them to Becky's body. It's not your fault. I've made a mistake. What's wrong? I've done something wrong, and it'll be on telly next week. She'd kept hoping he'd turn up at the pub. Is Michael around? He's not, I'm afraid. Have you heard anything from him? What's going on? Whatever it is, tell me. I can help. He didn't reply until the following day. 
even for murder. I think not. Let me know. It's Bex. He then wrote the text which sent her running to the pub, effectively a full confession, which led to a passing policeman being summoned. The text was explicit. Beck's body in freezes, meaning the freezer, in shed. Don't go near the shed. Just get yourselves a good drink. Let the police deal with her. I will give myself up in Swanley, Kent. He's going to kill him, sir. With the body found, and despite Michael's confession, police began the painstaking process of building a detailed case against him. I drove straight over there to see for myself, you know, suited and booted uh, what we had, uh, and then make decisions about what should happen. Because the body was frozen, there was no danger of contamination from fluids. Forensic scientists unwrapped Becky and bagged her head, hands and feet. I asked uh, a home office forensic pathologist to look at uh, Becky to try and give us an indication of cause of death. His opinion was that there was a gun uh, wound, if you like, in her head that uh, had probably caused death, but he wouldn't be able to uh, confirm until he conducted a post-mortem. The body was taken by Undertaker to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn and placed in the mortuary. Police didn't yet know about Michael's past suicide attempts, but as a killer on the run and as a potential danger to himself, it was vital he be found fast. There was always a possibility that Michael might try to take his own life. Uh, one of my sergeants is a hostage negotiator. I asked him with those skills to try to establish a rapport and a contact with Michael. At 13 minutes past eight that evening, the negotiator got through to his mobile. Uh, I know you know what I've done, right? But I loved her. I loved her, I couldn't, I couldn't be without her. I feel like hanging myself. I can't go. He repeated his promise to hand himself in at Swanley in Kent. He, he was brought up uh, as a young child in that area. He had family still living in that area. So it added credence to his uh, suggestion that he would hand himself in at uh, Swanley Police Station. Subsequent analysis of CCTV footage did indeed show Michael's car heading over the Dartford Bridge towards Swanley shortly after he'd left Norfolk. But in fact, he then headed to Hampshire. His car was later found outside a hotel in Hook, where he'd stayed. He left the town by train. But now, by analysing information from phone masts, police picked up on the trail. The data revealed Michael was using his mobile on the Isle of Wight. It emerged later he travelled across to the island as a foot passenger. From the telephone data, and you, you can't establish exactly where that person is, um, what we tend to do is try and identify an anchor point that he may have previously in his life, something that would give him a reason to go back to that location. They could find no anchor point. But the phone mask data indicated Michael had used his phone in the area of the linked towns of Shanklin and Sandown. While officers and a Coast Guard team scoured clifftops and the beach, police used their local island watch to spread news of Michael's presence. At a hotel on Victoria Road in Sandown, the owners recalled a man who checked in that morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. He'd used the name Can Michael Tyler, uh, yeah, not well, Tucker. Room, okay. Do you know the island well? I hope to soon. Um, just sold a pub, actually, that I had with my partner. Oh, right. And um, I'm thinking about using the money to buy one around here, maybe. It's just up these stairs he here. said he was from the Queen Victoria pub in Snettersham, not the Compasses. But he did match the description. One of the owners dialed 999. 
At 10 past 10 that night, the negotiator again got through to Michael. No, I can't talk. Call me in an hour. A police response unit was already on its way. This is room 12. Okay. Police, open up! When they got to the room, there was a key on the other side of the door, so they were unable to get in. There were sounds of movement and running water behind uh, the closed door that could possibly indicate that Michael was uh, causing harm to himself. They then made the decision to break into the room. Michael Tucker, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Rebecca it's not Thorpe. Suspicion. I've already admitted it. It's not suspicion. Uh, he looked unsteady on his feet, so they sat him down. OK, Michael, take a seat. Take a seat. Nice and steady, nice and steady. OK, it's there. Yeah. Right. Look, suicide note. He claimed that he uh, suffered from angina, um, and they called an ambulance. While in hospital in Newport, Michael was not technically in custody. But discharged from hospital two days later, police and criminal evidence rules meant investigators had a race against time to get him back to Norfolk for questioning. We had to take control of him and then bring him back to Norfolk within 24 hours. Obviously there's problems because there's ferries involved and, you know, travelling sort of halfway across the country. An interview room was arranged at the police station closest to the Norfolk border, Thetford. When I first came across Michael, it was in the interview room at Thetford police station, and he presented as a very small, upset, quiet, almost a reclusive man, very, very quietly spoken, very, very upset about the circumstances that he had found himself in. As he gave an account of the last day of Becky's life, he made no attempt to deny killing her. He described a day starting quite normally. They had uh, served customers at l after lunchtime. They had gone to bed. They had actually had sex in the afternoon. He said by the end of that evening, he'd had 10 pints to drink but didn't attribute to alcohol what he claimed happened next. Becky had gone up ahead to have a bath. You coming in? Just a couple of minutes, I'm gonna iron a shirt, all right? Everything is absolutely fine. He goes through after finishing ironing his shirt and sits on um, a step. We have only Michael's graphic account of what followed. He claimed that after simmering for months, tensions over his ex-partner exploded. She'd left him, taking their two children to Ireland on learning of his affair with Becky. Police believe Michael may have visited Ireland when he disappeared for three weeks in 2009. I've been thinking, Michael. Mm. I don't want you to see them again. Sorry? In Michael's version of the conversation he said took place, Becky told him he could no longer see his children. Where's this come from? From me. Decide, Michael, be a man, if you know what it means to be a man. Michael described Becky as speaking with hatred and sarcasm. He had had a vasectomy. He told police that as tensions mounted, he asked why Becky needed to be on the pill. Yeah, how come you're on the pill, yet you know I've had the snip? In a final showdown, Michael claimed Becky admitted sleeping with another man and said she'd be better off with him. If I have slept with him, deal with it! This is the account of a man trying to claim he was provoked into murder, and police never found any evidence that Becky had had an affair. All that's known for certain is that Becky was in the bath and a gun was in her bedroom.
He told police Becky didn't make a sound. Her head just tilted to one side. Michael dropped the gun at his feet. There was no question. Becky was dead. Michael's account was fairly straightforward. When the interview team started to go into more detail around that, he then tried to minimise what he had done, so he started to say that he hadn't meant to do it. Um, and that was something that we had to sort of disprove. Michael told police he'd spent that night head in hands on the step. The following day, he then opened up the pub as he normally would. He said that he periodically checked on her over a period of two days while she lay in the bath. He left her in the bath um, and the water obviously went cold thereafter. After a couple of days, he obviously realised that he needed to move her. He then emptied the bath and took her from the bath and put her and wrapped her into a duvet. He then bound the duvet in plastic sheeting from a new mattress using silver duct tape. He then took her downstairs out of the back of the pub. He emptied a chest freezer of items that were in that. He lowered Becky into the freezer and placed three empty beer kegs on the lid. The gun's under the mattress in the room on the left. The gun was wrapped in a thick uh, sort of duct tape. That was similar to the tape that had been used to sort of bind Becky in the duvet. We were able to find fingerprints from Michael uh, on the inside of the duct tape. Michael had used um, a 410 garden gun. Um, which is not a particularly powerful gun. It's usually used for shooting vermin, rabbits, that sort of thing. But it will certainly make a bang. But it would appear that nobody actually heard that um, at the relevant time. Forensic scientists found traces of blood in the bathroom, along with evidence of extensive cleaning. Michael was adamant the gun had gone off by accident. I don't know if I wanted to scare her with it and walk away. I don't know, because it went off. I didn't deliberately set out to kill her. Police wanted to prove this was not a gun which could easily be fired by accident with an over-delicate or faulty hair trigger. We had the ballistics expert test the gun. It was established that you know, a definite pressure would have to be applied. It wasn't a hair trigger. Michael claimed he'd been sitting on the bathroom step and had fired from the hip. The ballistics expert was asked to establish how far the gun was from uh, Becky's head when it was uh, fired. Using the size of the hole created by the uh, shot from the shotgun, he came up with a distance of between 18 and 30 inches. A short distance which reinforced detectives' belief the killing was deliberate. Michael knew exactly what he was doing that night when he took the decision to leave the step, pick up the gun, go through those four different stages of loading, closing, cocking, and pulling the trigger. He knew what he was doing that night. Becky was laying in the bath, facing the other direction, if they were having an argument. And she was not offering him any sort of threat. She was defenseless, laying in the bath. I think he felt it was in his interest to build himself up as the sad, uh, put upon, uh, discarded sort of lover, really. But if Michael ever did consider using that as an excuse in court, evidence was to come to light which would dramatically undermine such a defence. Michael Tucker, 50-year-old landlord of the Compasses Inn at Snettersham in Norfolk, had been arrested for the murder of 28-year-old Becky Thorpe, his lover with whom he ran the business. Her body had been found in a freezer behind the pub. Michael had admitted killing Becky, but 
was trying to claim that it was unintentional and uh, it was important from this stage to prove that he had made a conscious decision and carried that decision through. Inquiries were shedding new light on his relationship with Becky, over whom he'd been extremely possessive. He told police that the night he'd shot her, he'd become incensed when Becky said she'd be better off with another man. But whilst there was no evidence he had had an affair, it became clear his attentions had not been focused purely on Becky. <laughs> Michael himself was quite keen on pursuing ladies uh, throughout his relationship with Becky. Police learned the woman Michael texted revealing where he'd hidden Becky's body had previously sent him a love letter and given him a phone so he could contact her secretly. She'd been warned off by Becky. When she heard Becky had disappeared, she assumed Michael was single. Hello. <laughs> Man. Within a day, uh, she had returned to the pub and they had um, sexual intercourse in one of the rooms upstairs in the pub whilst Becky was lying outside in the freezer. Shortly after the killing, Michael also met his ex-partner at Birmingham Airport, minus their children. He was actually portraying um, himself to others as being in a relationship with his ex-partner, very much a couple. Having established that he was someone who would have relationships with other women somewhat contradicts what he says and, and sort of goes to show uh, his own manipulative nature, it goes to show that he was in, in charge of what was happening and that what he had done was commit murder. In one letter before his arrest, Michael wrote, I can't, can't live with myself. All I want to do now is die. I just lost all self-control. What kind of animal am I to be able to do this? At 10 p.m. on March the 26th, 2010, 17 days after the likely date of the killing, Michael was charged with murder. On May the 16th, 2011, his trial began at Norwich Crown Court. Michael denied murder, but admitted manslaughter on the grounds of provocation. He claimed it had not been a deliberate, premeditated act. The defence said he had an alcohol problem and had been depressed. He gave no evidence. Becky's brother and father were there. I don't know how to describe that feeling. You sit there looking eyeball to eyeball to the person that's wiped out the life of your daughter. It's a combination of anger, the thought that somebody else can take something that's very precious from us. Every time we made, or tried to make, eye contact across the courtroom, Michael did not want to reciprocate in any way. The judge told the jury they needed to decide whether Michael had had a sudden temporary loss of control when Becky had allegedly said he couldn't see his children and that she was sleeping with another man. Deal with it! After just 45 minutes of deliberation, the jury rejected that possibility and convicted Michael of murder. On the 24th of May, 2011, he was sentenced to a minimum of 26 years in jail. I thought, great, we've got the best result we possibly could have got. But Michael appealed against sentence. At the Court of Appeal in London, his defence argued the original judge had wrongly lumped this killing with executions carried out by gangs who shoot victims in the back of the head. The court agreed and in December 2011, reduced the minimum amount Michael must serve to 22 years. For Becky's family, it was a bitter blow to add to the pain of her killing. Because this was not a gangland killing, they decided that the judgment was too harsh, that the sentence would be reduced by four years. Where's the justice in that?
I feel that the justice system has failed my daughter. What we miss from Rebecca is that breezing in, 